Well, good evening, everyone. I have the honor of sitting down and talking with somebody who I've watched on TV for so many years, Chris Broussard of Fox Sports. And so welcome, Chris. Man, it is great to be on. Uh, you made me feel a little bit old with that statement, but, um, you know, I, I'm gr glad to be on with you. And the fact of the matter is, I have been on television for a long time now. <laughs> so I, I can't deny that anymore. Chris, you are one of our final speakers, and for the last five days, we've sat down and taken, in honor of Dr. King, taken his I Have a Dream speech, broke it up into five parts, and you are one of our final uh, speakers that I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, and we're, I can't wait to hear some of your thoughts later on tonight. Yeah, I, look, I, I'm excited about this conference. Um, one of my passions is to see the body of Christ, I, I would say the Bible believing body of Christ to unite across racial, denominational and political lines. Obviously that was a passion of Dr. King's and, and unfortunately it didn't happen at that time. So I, I, I'm a firm believer in that if the church, the body of Christ would unite across those racial, denominational, political and generational lines, that we could spark a revival in our nation uh, that would include the social justice and, and racial equality that we want to see uh, and also um, a return to some of the biblical morality that I think has been lost. So hopefully um, we will do as our Lord has commanded us and unite and be one. Yeah. Hey, Chris, even with your journey as well, to share a little bit. I mean, we're talking you're in New Jersey right now. Share with the audience a little bit about your own personal journey. Well, I, yeah, I live in New Jersey, um, but my journey, I would say I was raised Catholic and I became a, a born again Christian my senior year in college. Uh, it was through, I met my, who's now my wife, a girl in college that I was dating and she, she was a Christian. She was the first person to introduce me to biblical Christianity. And uh, after dating for about a year and a half, ups and downs and things like that, uh, I, I became a Christian. And uh, since then, you know, I, I've had this passion to reach men for, for the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, uh, a passion to really reach the African-American community, uh, all people, of course, but specifically African-American community for Christ. And as I said, to bring unity to the body of Christ um, across all of these various divisions that we have. Uh, I founded about eight years ago, nine years ago, the King Movement, uh, which is a national Christian men's movement. King is an acronym that stands for knowledge, inspiration, and nurture through God. And uh, our goal is to help men live out their Christian faith Monday through Saturday, or maybe I should say Sunday afternoon, through Saturday. <laughs> but, you know, in our marriages, our families, our relationship with our children in the, in the workplace, uh, in our fraternities, whatever, wherever it may be, we feel like if we have strong men of God, then we'll have strong families, uh, strong communities, and we'll be stronger as a nation. Yeah. Hey, Chris, you know, I think a lot of times, I mean, even with you, I mean, everyone knows you, everyone watches you, your popular Instagram, you've been covering the NBA for so many different years. How, do, what does that look like for you to live your faith out Sunday afternoon to Monday, every single day? Hey, that, that's a great question. Um, obviously the NBA world is a, a different type of environment than your average workplace. And so um, it is, I would say number one and being up at, when I was at ESPN or the New York Times or even uh, now at Fox Sports, it's just really trying to stay true to your principles. And um, you all, we all get opportunities to get involved in things that go against our biblical principles. And I think shining your light, being a witness, is staying true to your beliefs and, and also showing compassion um, to your co-workers and, um, you know, not being dog eat dog. I mean, we all want to be successful and progress in our careers, 
But uh, I would say you can still do that and be true to your biblical principles where you're not looking to step on people. You're not looking to uh, get your success at the expense of others. I think all of those things uh, are witnesses. Uh, I've had instances where um, I've been involved in some controversy because of statements I've Mm -hmm. made in support of the Bible and, and biblical principles. And I firmly believe that one thing that kept me from being fired (laughs) in one instance in particular was that people stood up for me in the workplace and said, Chris is true to his beliefs. You may not agree with them, but he is true to them. And had they had examples or evidence of me doing things in the workplace that were against my proclamations uh, as a Christian, if I was getting involved, you know, sexually with the makeup girls <laughs> or with other coworkers uh, at my network, I firmly believe if I, if I was getting drunk with people, you know, at the network and cursing and things like that at the network, I think I would have got fired. Yeah. But people stood up to me for me and said, no, he, he stands on what he believes and he lives it. And I'm not saying that to be braggadocious. I'm just saying if, if we as Christian Christians are to speak up about the faith and stand up for biblical principles, then we need to live them. And if when we don't live them, that opens us up to um, accusations of hypocrisy that in many cases may be true if we don't live up to our faith. So if we're going to proclaim it, then we need to live it. And that will help us not only be a witness in our workplaces, but I think that'll help us when people dis- disagree with what we say. Yeah. They may say we disagree, but those are his beliefs and we're going to support him in that. Yeah. And Chris, this actually applies to all of us, whether you're African-American, whether it's me as Asian-American, Caucasian, young or old, how do we continue to implement and like understand what Christ has done for us and through that continue to die to ourselves every single day to serve those around us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, you know, with, uh, as I look at Dr. King's speech in that last section, he says with this faith, we will be able to heal out of the mountains of despair, a stone of hope for you. What does that mean to you, Chris? Well, that that's the, with this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. I think, number one, it talks about the hope that is part and parcel with the Christian life and the Christian experience. I'm going to be honest with you. If I were not a Christian, I would look at the situation in our country yeah. and I'd be pretty hopeless, I think. Yeah, I really would think that we're a country in in major trouble and we may be, (laughs) but there is hope in Jesus Christ. And I firmly believe that if the church would unite the way God called us to unite, and that's what Martin Luther King was saying. He was obviously speaking to black and white Christians, mainly white Christians. And he was saying, if we could unite as Jesus called us to unite, remember John chapter 17, verse 21, Jesus was praying and he said he prayed to the father that we, the believers, the future believers in him would be one as he and the father are one. And he said when they are one, like you and I are one, that's when the world will believe that you sent me. So that's the scripture saying the world will believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior when the body of Christ is united. And we, we have to admit, we're not united. We are as divided, if not more divided across racial lines than the world. And I'm speaking, I'm generalizing, but you know what I mean. Uh, and, and we are responsible for a lot of the negativity that goes on in our country. Even if we aren't participating in it, even if we don't support it, we're responsible because we're not being the salt and the light that Jesus told us to be. And salt is a preservative, you know, and it keeps you, salt preserves food from bacteria. As the church, we're supposed to preserve our society from spiritual bacteria and decay. And we haven't done that. 
And that's one reason that our nation is going through the, the things it's going through right now. Chris, in the second sentence, he talks about this beautiful symphony of brotherhood. You and I are meeting each other for the very first time. You don't know anything about me except that I'm sitting here in Chicago. I don't know very much about you except what I see on Twitter and Facebook and everything uh, and watch on TV. But because of the bond that we have in Jesus Christ, I look at you more than just an African-American person. I look at you as my brother, someone that I'm going to go with the battle with, so I'm going to die for someone. And we have to learn to be able to do that in this day and age. And for some reason, we are divided between Democrat, Republican, Asian, white. I, I don't understand this. Well, that is a profound statement that you said. And you're absolutely right. We, we need to be a brotherhood regardless of race. That's the beauty about the Christian faith is the is the great mosaic of ethnicities that are a multitude of all peoples. And you look at many religions around the world and they're very cultural. They're 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 most of what they do and a lot of their doctrine and rituals and and customs revolve around one particular culture. The difference with Christianity is that it, that's not the case. It is made up of people of all different cultures who are brothers and sisters. And you, you hit it on the head. And this has been the case with me throughout my walk through the NBA. When I meet a Christian uh, who really, you know, really loves the Lord and, and is not ashamed of their faith, I feel an immediate bond with them. I may not know them from Adam. But there is an immediate bond mm -hmm. in our in the way we feel about each other, in our conversation and, and to your point, looking out for one another. And we we all should feel that way in the body of Christ. And as you said, we don't. And I'm going to say this. One of my members, he's uh, one of our executives in the King movement. And he made a profound statement to me a few years ago. When we were talking about the racial situation in this country. And he said, one of the problems is he said that white Christians, and I'm not trying to pick on white Christians, but he <laughs> said white Christians feel more of a bond and feel more committed to white non-believers than they do with black and Asian and Native American Christians. And I'm going to be honest, because of that, Black people, Black Americans responded to that, Black the Black church. So we have our own bonds around our ethnicity. And I feel closer with some African Americans that aren't Christians than I do with some white Christians. And we, that should not be the case. We, we can still, we still have pride in our ethnicity and things like that. I'm very proud to be African-American. You come to my house, you'll see black and African art throughout the, the house. Uh, but even all that being the case, I'm closer in reality with a white or Asian Christian than I am with an African-American non-Christian. And until we as the body of Christ not only believe that in theory, but actually believe that in practice and show that in practice, we're going to have the issues that we're having today. And to be honest, the, the way things are going right now, the church will be pushed to the periphery of society and yeah. underground the yeah. way we're going. But yet if we could unite as we talked about and believe that we're all one, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, Eskimo, so have, have you, if that happens, I think, again, we could really spark a revival. Yeah, Chris, we're looking at even the numbers, 10%. I mean, back in 10 years ago, 50% of the U.S. were saying that they were prof professing evangelicals. That number now has dropped to below 30% in the newest study. More and more p church people look at Christians, and they are disgusted by what they see. Uh, for you, I mean— what is that tangible thing? You talked about unity and everything like that. We're not going to change the world. Are there concrete steps, in your opinion, that we need to do in this next year, in these next couple months, to really begin to reform our image or develop that unity within the church? 
Well, that's a, that's a great point and question. First of all, you're right. What you said about evangelicals, I, I, and I'm not saying this is true, but I, this is the perception. And sometimes it is true, but the perception of white evangelicals, it, that phrase, white evangelicals, that title is virtually synonymous with racist and, and, and rightly or wrongly. I'm saying if a white evangelical goes on a network, CNN, MSNBC, whatever it may be, and you're speaking and the label white evangelical comes up, a lot of people are going to view you as a racist. Mainstream whites will write you off as a racist. And even many African-Americans or people of color who agree with you theologically, they will also think you're a racist. So that's the image of the white evangelical church, unfortunately. And, And I've I know many white evangelicals that I'm friends with and they're great people and they're not personally prejudiced toward me or anything like that. But as a collective, that is the image of the white evangelical church. Now, how do you, I, I, I do believe there are tangible steps that the church could take to rid itself of that image and to just be, be a benefit to society and to the body of Christ. Um, let's keep it real. Now, all people can be prejudiced regardless of skin color or ethnicity, but in the United States of America, racism has been a white problem. It's like if my wife and I, if if I'm beating up my wife, I hate to use that example, but if I'm beating up my wife, it's not a problem with both of us. You know, it's not, well, she's got just as much change as I need to No, I'm the problem and I need to make a change. And the white church needs to recognize racism in America is a white problem. And you have to take steps to fix it along with your brothers and sisters of other races. So I I would say this, uh, the problem, I'm not into the touchy feely, hug each other. That's fine. I can hug people and, and all that. But racism is not about feelings. Racism really is about economics. In this country, is about capital and resources. And I don't really care, Tommy, if a white individual does not like me. I don't care if they don't like me because I'm black. I care when they have the power to ruin or hinder my life because I'm black. And that is the crux of We live in a capitalistic society. And if we're going to fix this problem of racism in America, it is about capital and resources. And if you look at the history of this country, white Americans, by and large, I'm not speaking every individual, every individual, but by and large, have been provided with the capital and resources to competently compete as a whole in this capitalistic society. I'm not even talking about slavery. I mean, we could start there, of course, But beyond that, the Homestead Acts of the 1860s that gave 270 million acres to white Americans west of the Mississippi and in the South for free. All right. The the, uh, Social Security Act of the early 20th century that kept domestic workers and farmers out of being able to get Social Security. When 80 percent, roughly, of African Americans were domestic workers and farmers, that's a way of having racism without stating the race. Then you had the GI Bill from 1944 to 1958, I believe, or 56, perhaps, that where the the overwhelming majority of African Americans who fought in the war did not get the benefits, the jobs, the career development the tuition for school, the mortgages for their homes that white American veterans got. And then you go to the Federal Housing Administration loans from 1934 to 1962, where they gave out $120 billion of government-backed loans. 98% of them went to white Americans. And then they coupled that with redlining in black communities where you couldn't get mortgages or home insurance. And if you did, the rates were sky high. That built the white suburbs and suburbs, which at that time would not allow blacks in. 
My point is that you look at something like the racial wealth gap, which is essentially 10 to one. That's one that that's racism. That's what needs to be dealt with. So I believe the the white church in partnership with believers of all races needs to put forth a massive agenda for social and racial justice, where many of these wrongs of the past are righted economically. For instance, let's all most of the Ivy League colleges, Tommy, have admitted that they benefited from slavery. So what? OK, that's nice that you said that. But what are we going to do about it? How about if a Harvard, which by itself has 20 times the endowment of all of the HBCUs, 102 HBCUs combined? How about if a Harvard gave just 3% of its endowment to Howard University and HBCU? And Princeton did the same thing to Spelman. That is tangible change. That is meeting the economic situation. We're talking about Dr. King. Everybody, I love the I Have a Dream speech. We all love that. But before Dr. King died, he had really moved on to economics. He was really talking about, he was even using the phrase, cut the check. Like he was about bringing economic empowerment to poor people of all races, particularly African-Americans, because he looked when he went up north, he got out of Birmingham and, and all that. And he went up north. He saw this is an animal that I don't know that how we how to deal with when he saw the poverty that people of African descent were living in. And he concluded it was about economics. So I think, Tommy, to wrap this up, if the white church promoted that type of agenda where it really called for strong, you know, empowerment of, of people of color in this country, where it really stood up for justice, biblical justice, that would, one, eradicate its image as being racist. And two, it would bring the body of Christ together because most African-Americans being at least nominal Christians, are socially conservative. But African-Americans tend to vote with the Democrats for other reasons, and, and we go against our socially conservative principles. And that's a real problem too. But if you had a, if the white church had a bold agenda of social justice, African-Americans and people of color of faith would be on board with the socially conservative, the pro-family aspect of it. Abortion is killing the African-American community at a disproportionate rate. That could be a part of the agenda. You know, uh, all of these, so that would, we could, if we could really ultimately unite on a kingdom agenda that include, included biblical morality in regards to the family and things, but also stood up for biblical justice, I think that would, like I said, eradicate the racist image of the white church and allow the church in a, as a whole in America to unite. Those Bible believing Christians could unite. And, and I'm going to be honest, that type of movement would also draw Mormons and Catholics and Muslims and Orthodox Jews who want to live according to the principles of their faith. And we know that our moral principles are very similar. So I think that that is what needs to be done. There are many tangible things that could be done with that. But in a nutshell, that's it. Yeah. And honestly, as we wrap up, Chris, and I, as I hear you talk, that challenge is for pastors are good. They'll, they'll talk on the pulpit and all that stuff. It actually is a challenge to our white or even Asian or business leaders, Christian business leaders who are overseeing schools, uh, hospitals, uh, businesses, startups, companies to make sure this happens. They have to be a salt and light in their city, in their state, in this country, that the decisions that they meet does not go the bottom line, go with in their pockets, but they're used to serve other people. Amen. Tommy, I, I think unfortunately, and this may go across racial lines, but a lot of Christian businessmen, they, I'm just going to call it like I see it. 
they put capitalism ahead of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't do that anymore. And I'm going to say this too, being that this is a seminary. I also think that part, and we want to eradicate white supremacy. We don't want to lift up Asian supremacy or black supremacy, but we want to eradicate white supremacy. We want God supremacy. Um, Because white supremacy or racial supremacy is idolatry. And so a part of eradicating that is also the education. And I know, because I've almost went to seminary, I've sat in on seminary classes on the history of the church. And what I sat in on a class about the history of the Christian church at a seminary. And it really, they gave us the syllabus and everything. It really wasn't the history of the Christian church. It was the history of the European Christian church from Catholicism to the Reformation, even dealt with the radical Reformation a bit, but it neglected the Egyptian Coptic church, the Ethiopian Orthodox church, the Indian Orthodox church, the Persian church. Christianity is not only diverse today, it has been diverse from day one. There there were Christians in China as well. Christian, the apostles took it literally, the great commission, go throughout the world and spread the gospel. Martin Luther, the reformer, learned from, I believe his name was Michael the deacon, who was in the Orthodox or Indian Ethiopian Orthodox church. And he gave much credit for some of the ideas he had in reforming the church to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. To what he, he felt the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was closer to biblical Christianity than Roman Catholicism. Now, all of that needs to be taught in our seminaries, because if that's taught in our seminaries, then white Christians will see the contributions that other people, people of color have made to Christianity. And I think even subconsciously that makes you have more respect for people of color. This is not a Western religion. This is not a a white European religion, but it has been promoted like that to some degree. And if we study the true history of the churches, church in our seminaries, then I think we would eradicate that sort of thinking And I think that's very important. I don't know what the classes at Northern teach, but we need to we need to diversify. And I'm not saying just do it to do it because it'd be nice. It'd be nice for black people to see themselves here and there. No, it's truth. Augustine, Tertullian, Origen, Athanasius, Cyprian, they were all Africans. Those are major theologians who helped shape Western theology. Monasticism started in Africa. Ethiopia is either either the first or second oldest Christian church or or country in the world. These things need to be taught to white and black alike and all races so that we can see and understand that God was not lying. He was not playing when he said his church is a multitude of all peoples. That's not a 20th century thing. That has always been the case. Chris, thank you. Hey, as we wrap up in this last minute, you're one of the last final speakers. End us well. What's your words of encouragement? What's your words of advice? What's your words of challenge, my friend? I would say let's uh, keep Christ first. Uh, it's very possible that, you know, we as members of the body of Christ are going to be challenged in our faith uh, over the next, you know, as time goes forward. It's possible. Uh, So we need to keep our mind focused on Christ and um, we need to unite, as we talked about, come together and uh, stay hopeful. As as Dr. King said, um, our faith brings with it a stone of hope. So stay hopeful that if we follow our Lord and do what he's called us to do, we can um, have life and have it more abundantly, not only individually, but corporately. And I would say this too, as I end, um, if you look at this speech by Dr. King, I have a dream, and you look toward the end, Tommy, he says, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we are free at last. He said, we all, all God's children, white, black, so on and so forth, would say this. He was speaking of corporate freedom. 
too much too often in America because we're an individualistic society, we think of our faith as individualistic. When Jesus said, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Like Jesus was very much about, you know, this faith is about other people and helping other people and being united with other people. When we look in the book of Acts chapter two and chapter four, and we see that the, uh, the, the believers sold their goods and their homes to help the believers that didn't have anything. So none of them would lack. Now, I'm not saying we have to do all that and become communists like that. But I am saying we should have a mentality where we look out for our brothers and our brothers in the body of Christ, Asian, Hispanic, African-American, white, whatever, Native American, we need to look out for all of them. And Dr. King was saying, we are not free until all of us have the economic opportunities that this great wealthy country provides for. Because you would look at this statement and say, well, white people, they were free, right? They had great freedom, 1960, 63. They had great freedom. What's Martin Luther King talking about? He's saying, no, you don't. You're not free because your African-American brothers and sisters are not free. And so we need to begin thinking about Christianity. Yes, it's a very individual thing, but it also is corporate. And part of the way I believe Jesus was going to meet, supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory and all of that stuff was through the body of Christ. For some people, he's not just going to drop manna from heaven. It, that bread, that economic opportunity, that food, that job is going to come from some other human being, preferably maybe within the body of Christ. And so we need to start thinking not only individually, but corporately as a body. Chris, thank you so much for your wise words. And uh, hey, for those who have joined us over the week, thank you. And we really want to end with Chris's words and challenge and Thank you for all of you who have joined us on uh, this whole week.